Hello and welcome. Make sure this mic is working okay, <clears throat> better than my voice. Um, I'm Dirk Zahagian. Um, we've put together a session here. This is the, the first of three um, centennial biogeosciences uh, sessions today. This is the Pulse of the Living Planet. This after, um, the next one after break is Transformations over the last 100 years. And this afternoon is posters for all of them uh, in the poster hall. Um, <clears throat> we have a great lineup of speakers, so we're going to get started right away. I know it's 8 o'clock. Uh, our first um, to start with an introduction for biogeosciences, Sue Tromboy, our former president of biogeosciences, and I will uh, say a few things after that, then we'll continue on. Okay. Oh, eight minutes, eight minutes. This is a new thing. Eight <laughs> minutes. I got a hook. Okay, and Dork and I are going to do four and four, so let's see how that works. So... Um, Biogeosciences is briefly defined by Marcus Reichstein out there as the metabolism of the earth, and I think it's a great way of putting it. The, uh, you'll hear more in the second session from Patrick Krill about the history of biogeosciences, but very briefly the idea that life in, is intimately tied to the other spheres of the earth's system has been around for a long time. We're all familiar with, uh, you know, the Vernadsky uh, work La Biosphere that, that was published almost 100 years ago um, that gave, you know, is sort of what is the basis of the biogeochemical cycling of elements um, in the earth. Um, I like this quote from um, Arthur Tansley that just says, we cannot separate the uh, life from their, organisms from their special environment with which they form one physical system. And um, after the World War II, bio biology and geology kind of became separate uh, silos and um, they weren't taught together. So the, um, uh, until we could sort of see the earth from space as a whole, the pale blue dot, and um, the, I think personally the Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis really brought together a lot of the idea that we can't study the earth without the life. Um, when I was a graduate student, I learned this, that the Redfield ratio, the stoichiometry of nitrogen to phosphorus in the world's ocean has this constant ratio. That's because of biology, but we don't really need to know the details of the biology because it's a constant ratio. And many people still feel that way. But um, people have also learned that you know, there are large deviations from the Redfield ratio in an individual organisms, and that this is probably an emergent property, the constant stoichiometry that has to do with the communities that live there. And, you know, if we're on a changing earth, we need to understand how those communities vary. Um, Redfield also was, you know, almost a century ago. So um, with the recognition that biogeos, that, that uh, we need to integrate biology into the uh, American Geophysical Union, the Biogeosciences section was formed officially in 2001. It was then about 3% of AGU's membership. Um, by 2016, it was uh, about 7% of the primary members and 16% of the secondary affiliations. Um, there's a total of 14,000 people in 2016, which is the last year I had numbers for. If you look at the meeting here, many of the sessions are uh, biogeosciences, I think it's about 10% of the sessions. And we have two journals, um, uh, JGR Biogeosciences and Global Biogeochemical Cycles. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. All right. Um, there's some problems dealing with uh, biogeosciences. One thing is that we only have one sort of planet to check with. You know, we don't have a, we, there's no control. So we mess with it and it's a nice experiment. We don't know how it would have been otherwise. There are very few pristine natural systems left to be able to uh, compare against. Um, <clears throat> it's also difficult to, to see the whole world at the same time. Um, and there are a number of ecosystems and otherwise that are perturbed. And um, we, you know, we may lose some of these uh, records and proxies forever. Um, I put together my own sort of uh, ravings on what's happened in the last hundred years, where we got today, and what we might hope for in the next hundred years. Um, uh, there's not time to go through all of these, but um, briefly, let's see. Um, can I use a pointer? We can. 
At one point, there were a lot of fish in the sea. Now, uh, not so much. Maybe in 100 years, we'll be able to have a sustainable marine ecosystem. Um, there was um, a time where we thought life was all right here on the planetary surface. Now we know better. <clears throat> Someday, maybe something different. Um, nitrogen used to be fixed by the bacteria in the soils of the world, but in the 80s, we, um, we surpassed all that nitrogen fixation by the Haber-Bosch process to make fertilizer to feed all the people. Um, well, maybe someday we'll have some um, steady state equilibrium of global biogeochemical cycles in general. Um, we've been um, <clears throat> living off the interest of the global ecosystem that providing us goods and services for humanity. Um, so in, in an open planet that was capable of providing what we needed and absorbing our wastes, an open planet. Um, we now still treat it as an open planet, but we're eating into the principle. So it's going to provide less interest anathema to any trust fund manager. Um, maybe someday we'll treat it as a closed planet with everything being recycled like a spaceship. So, um, but that'll be some time. Um, we used to be industrialists, like, oh, okay, we're going to exploit natural resources for the economic benefit of humanity. Um, and that worked out very well. It worked out so well that now it's, doctor, doctor, please fix the problems we've created. Um, so maybe someday we'll be able to work together with social systems to reach societal goals. Um, yeah, science used to be old white guys. Um, right? I, I'm very proud that in Baiju Sciences, we're leading the way in AGU and beyond in this regard. And maybe someday, it just won't be an issue at all. Um, and of course, in the bottom here, um, recent things. Someday we'll have science-based decision making, hopefully soon. Um, OK. In this session, we've got the length and breadth of biogeosciences in all these areas. And I'm not going to rant and rave too long before introduce, introducing the next speaker, um, who is Pep Canadell. Come on up. Between, we don't have much time between speakers, so we're going to be quick. Eight minutes. Where do I press? The turn? Good morning, everyone. And thanks for the wonderful opportunity to uh, speak uh, in the session. They've got this. Two it doesn't go against my eight minutes. No, no, we didn't start it yet. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go straight into it. It's really difficult to not to zoom in into Charles uh, Killing right away if anyone is going to talk about the revolution of carbon cycle sciences over the last uh, you know, 100 years. So I love this paper from him from 1960 where he you know, kind of did the grand synthesis of where we were with uh, CO2 measurements. Um, you know, he showed um, uh, some of the data he had done from flights, some of the first data he had from Mauna Loa, and he uh, showed very clearly this, you know, CISO uh, pattern, which, you know, became so famous later on. He understood very well because he also did Delta C1314 that that CISO pattern was really due to the plants breeding and talking about the poles of the planet. That was the poles of the planet. I love this little sentence he has hidden somewhere in the paper that says, where data extend beyond one year, averages for the second year are higher than for the first year. And I think that little he knew that, you know, that was the beginning of a revolution, a scientific revolution, certainly in carbon cycle sciences, but of course bigger than that in, in you know, civil society uh, as we see now climate change. You may have seen these, uh, this little movie many times before, but they, they, it remains a fundamental summary of what so much what we have learned. So this is uh, after Dave Killing, uh, a whole global, um, a whole global uh, observational uh, network was established, 
and here what you see from Nadi South to Nadi North, you know, truly the poles of the planet, and so many things we learn with this as we're trying to kind of define the sources and sinks. You know, you see the gradient from north to south, a bigger, you know, higher concentrations in the north because the, the, most of the emissions were coming from the north. Uh, we learned so much about the changes in the amplitude of the seasonality, you know, showing us that there had to be some, a big sink in the north of, of the planet. Uh, we also, as we put more and more um, observational sites, we began to understand the uh, impacts of climate variability, the impacts of regional droughts and, and big El Niños and La Niñas in controlling the CO2 concentration and the growth rate of it. All of it were fundamentally for us to begin to test our hypothesis of what was driving the processes behind. Uh, which is going back now to where Killing was alone himself doing measurements all the way to 1958 before we launch a second revolution in really in our understanding when we start moving back in time through the ice core and the fern and uh, first with you know some of the the, the, the sorrow kind of first 2000 years and then moving back to you know during the 70s and 80s and all the way to to, to now, to the last 800,000 years, see the concentrations from you know, the bubble of the ice, uh, air trapped in the bubble of the ice. The reason this thing was so important for us is because it began to kind of pose ourselves the, the opportunities to bring the hypothesis of carbon climate feedbacks. We knew that these big ups and downs were due to mostly external planetary forces, but that climate, uh, climate feedbacks or carbon climate feedbacks, you know, were amplifying and dampening all many of these kind of uh, patterns that we saw. And it was the beginning also to really for us understand and start hypothesizing a lot of the, the processes we are now invoking for the future carbon climate, you know, future uh, carbon climate uh, feedbacks, which we think that uh, are, will become important as uh, global temperatures uh, uh, increase. Not sure if I said this thing, but this was done by, by um, Andy Jacobson, which is a beautiful way to bring all the data together. Uh, he was at NOAA when he first did this thing. The other thing that I'm fascinating is now just kind of 20 years forward from those first measurements, and we had this great understanding of uh, the, the ocean uh, the, I would say that the, the global CO2 model where we understood quite well what the ocean was doing. And that was because we had a lot of tracers to really kind of, um, kind of constrain the amount of CO2 that was going into the atmosphere. We had the, the, the C14 uh, bomb, we had the, the depletion of C14 in the fossil fuel that we were emitting, the, uh, the radon associated to it, they were all beautiful tracers. They gave us a really clear understanding of how much was going on. But then we knew that we couldn't close the budget with all the emissions we thought we were putting and that the biosphere perhaps was playing a role. At that point, we had no clue what the biosphere was doing. We didn't know it was a sink, whether it was a source, whether it was neutral. We knew there was a lot of deforestation, and we understood some of the first principles of physiology. Plants like to have more CO2, and they grow more in our greenhouse gases. So we went from saying, is there a biosphere sink? Is there a missing CO2 sink? Actually, we call it then the missing CO2 sink. And later on, for a couple of decades, we call it the residual land scene because clearly we had a lot of constraints, particularly again in the isotopic world, um, that clearly point out the role of, of the land very uh, sharply. Now we went from, do we have a sink on the land? Do we have a, a residual? Um, to really call it what is now the land sink. And actually that's probably has come not clear to many people, but for the last two years, we call it officially the land sink because we're now um, measuring the land sink specifically independently as we do for the fossil fuel emissions, for the land use emissions, for the atmospheric growth, and for the ocean sink. And what we have now is a residual of the budget, but it's not a residual that is associated with the land, it's a residual associated with the entire not matching or not closing the mass budget when we measure all these things independently, an incredible advancement. Now, where we had the most fun ourselves in science has really trying to pinpoint where these things are. 
and perhaps to some extent a little bit embarrassing still now, we still have disagreements on particularly with a net sink, not just where all the gross sinks are, but when we bring deforestation in, degradation, you know, where really these, these things are, particularly on the land sector, and there's still a little attention between the tropics versus how big the northern hemisphere sink is. Just to finish, just to say that for the future, I think there's, there's two things which has been always really close to, to us in terms of the big objectives of the community, but really we have now zoomed in very sharply as to what needs to be done, and that is tracking and support the trajectory towards net zero emissions, which is what's required to do stabilization, and not just of carbon, but actually the whole greenhouse gases, and understanding the process of it, and then anticipating carbon climate feedbacks, uh, which is all the carbon climate work that we do and that needs to be done into the future, looking at the whole space of warming, but also something that is quite new now, that is how we, the dynamics of the carbon cycle, may respond to reversing you know, the emission trajectory we had for so many decades as a stabilization of the climate now requires the uptake of CO2 from the atmosphere and removal and going what we call negative emissions. And we have no appreciation, you know, fully on how the earth and the carbon cycle will react to, to this reversal. Thank you very much. Way to go, staying on time. Our next speaker, Stefan Mesker. And it works. And the PC mouse. I put this one here. Is it Pap's glasses or yours? Okay. Thank you, Dork, for the brief introduction. What I'm going to talk about is from new and field sites to information discovery. And what better to start such a talk than with a look at Stonehenge <laughs> and the history of astronomy. So when we take a look at that, we start at places such as Stonehenge, where it goes back to these ages, thousands of years. Eventually, we humankind discovered a telescope, uh, got deeper insights even through opening up the electromagnetic spectrum. And eventually, we ended up in a digital age where we find ourselves now. And what this comes along with are advances in information recording from carvings in stone, over writing, hand drawings, photographs, tapes, to digital media. Again, that's the kind of stuff we're dealing with today. And here's where the first type of commonalities are coming in, in the biogeosciences. Biogeosciences science knowledge is not new at all. It goes back to indigenous ecological knowledge, such as um, fire management by Arip, uh, Aborigines a thousand of years ago. They just knew what works. Not necessarily why, but it worked. Then we had our great scientific voyages, Humboldt, Lyle, Darwin, going back in the 1800s, mathematical models eventually, so more an understanding of causation, and eventually what we call today environmental research networks. What do all of these things have in common is a shift in scientific paradigm. So we start with empirical beginnings work our way over theory, generalizations, computational simulations, and where we find ourselves now is in the very exciting age of data-intensive information discovery. All very exciting, right? But. But it is really hard to actually collect data that's representative of the whole diversity of ecosystems that you see even within a local region, but certainly when you start to scale up to a national or continental or global scale. That's the scale at which we can really test questions about ecosystem sensitivity to climate and how that changes with latitude, with ecosystem type, with climatic extremes. So much of ecology is of, we found this really interesting ecological pattern, but it's specific on you know, this elevational gradient, or this time of day, or this particular El Nino cycle. Field data, they're really expensive and logistically difficult to arrange and collect. Now, at the same time, we get about 200% more data in our field of science every year, and pardon my omission, however, those are really piecemeal. Meaning, yes, we do have ground-based information, airborne, spaceborne, but these observations do not yet necessarily overlap in space and time, or only fractionally. So how 
can we deal with that going forward? Can experiment design come to the rescue? Hierarchical experiment design is nothing new. At the same time, in addition to thinking about areas of mutual representative in space and time, maybe it could also help to think about areas of exclusion where we don't actually want to co-locate sensors because they might reciprocally impact each other. That's one of the great things about NEON is that it's collecting field data and other types of information across a widely distributed set of sites that represent the biomes that we have in the U.S. NEON collects fundamental ecological data about biogeochemistry, about the water cycle, about species and biodiversity and the structure of vegetation. They have flux towers that measure gas exchange and gas uptake. Then over these different NEON sites, we have these aerial measurements, whether it be LIDAR or hyperspectral data, that we can use to measure the pulse, the heartbeat and lung capacity of ecosystems. So this is great, right? We're kind of beginning to work our way more towards an information continuum. And what's even better, it's not just one observatory. It's many observatories working along this direction, coming closer together, coming better coordinated. Yes, we do have NEON, LTR, we do have critical zone observatories, Ameriflux, FluxNet, and so forth. So truly inching our way forward in terms of observations to become better coordinated. At the same time, our observations oftentimes underlay fundamentally, uh, fundamentally different physical principles. What that means is what we're quite used to look at our Earth's surface in a very regular, gridded fashion, like remote sensing observations data, which you see here. And we're trying to then superimpose or use them together with atmospheric observations from towers, which really represent some sort of an upwind plume that changes every second, every minute, every hour. So we do want to think about, more closely think about math-based interrelationship to fully extract the joint information content between these different types of observation and representations. And for this, we need some smart software so that not everybody has to come up with their own software and spend a lot of effort and time on that. We might do better as a community to think modular, to think about applications, mo modules that can be reused for individual science domains or specializations uh, to be used with slight modifications. And so these are all areas, both experiment coordination, um, coming up with math-based interrelationships, and these kind of modular applications where NEON is really there for the community and is attempting to interact and move the field forward together to eventually come to a place, an information continuum, where we can truly do unbiased data simulation, forecasting, intervention, and damage prevention. Ecological forecasting is a really useful way to gain a better understanding of our ecosystems and how they are changing. It's a way scientists are helping policymakers and landowners take a peek into the future to anticipate major environmental change. Like the weather service models have shown, ecological forecasting accuracy will improve through time as more predictions are made, tested against actual data, and then refined. As a result, ecological forecasts will inform planning efforts that allow humans and the environment to thrive moving forward. So where to go from here? Please check out our data, check out our tools, resources, and let us know what works and what doesn't so we can work together to improve the field. Get involved with us. We do have working groups. We do have steering committees. We do have workshops, uh, such as uh, two days ago here at AGU, uh, other workshops just such as NCAR and NEON coming up. Outlook, um, improved linkages among resources, absolutely. That's what our field is working towards. We do need specialization. We do need domain specialists, uh, and in particular, collaboration between domain specialists and computer scientists to truly tap into the full complement of information that's available to us. Improved coverage through telepresence, meaning wireless sensors can truly help improve coverage in space and time of how we're observing the Earth. Customized analytics that are mashed up from common components, we've been talking about that, modules that can be reused, that are not just a single purpose. Some of these applications require growing computational power. Not everybody has access to it, but it becomes much and much easier through entities and services such as cybers. And last, not least, science of environmental applications, meaning science that is useful for decision-making, even when our observations are incomplete. Thank you.
Stefan. Now in the um, last of our what could be called short talks in the carbon cycle, Catherine Freeman. Uh, good morning, everybody, uh, and I want to start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to speak to you today and to share some of my thoughts about the carbon cycle. Um, and let's see, I have a, oh, this is my pointer? No. Oh, that's the pointer. Thank you. I'm not fully awake. Okay. There you go. Thank you very much. Um, and so I'm interested, and, and as somebody who comes from a geologic background, and I've worked for many years in paleoclimate, uh, and, and organic geochemistry, we, we think about the intersection in the, of uh, biological processes and geological processes every day in our work. And of course, we share an interest with all members of the biogeosciences community in sort of the redox balance or the, the carbon cycle balance between uh, production of uh, organic matter and the, the oxidation of it back to CO2 and the consequences of it for the redox of a particular environment. Um, uh, and today, I'd like to talk about um, the sort of short circuit or the, the fate of fossil carbon that gets remobilized during the weather and river transport system uh, in, in landscapes. And, and this is really drawing on the work of my co-author, Valier Galli, uh, who and his, uh, his fine team of sort of intrepid um, oceanographers who are studying the, the transport of carbon in rivers and out into marine environments. Um, and, and Today, uh, in modern rivers, there's a, about 200 uh, megatons of carbon is uh, transported as particulate organic carbon. Um, and of that, about 15 to 20 percent is uh, fossil, uh, fossil carbon. And if that just gets redeposited, then it's a short circuit and it doesn't really impact the contemporary carbon cycle. But as uh, Jordan Hem Hemingway and others have shown, this carbon is actually fairly reactive once it's liberated from its uh, geologic archive. Um, and so that leads us to this sort of balance or paradox of, uh, of uh, fossil carbon and biospheric carbon. Uh, as uh, by, uh, uh, fossil carbon is moved out of its uh, geologic archive and across the landscape, it, if, if it's oxidized, that carbon then is returned back to the carbon cycle, and that uh, becomes a source of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and the, and the global uh, carbon budget. Uh, in contrast, uh, as organic carbon that's biospheric is buried, then that actually is a sequestering of CO2 from, from the atmosphere. And I would say in the modern world, these, the scales of these processes of oxidation and, um, and burial uh, are more or less in balance uh, with perhaps a slight favor for the, the burial. And then there's this uh, slight uh, weathering um, piece that removes carbon dioxide, which the geologists have long thought about. Um, but that's actually a small flux on this, the time scales that we're talking about here. So this, this loss of carbon dioxide through the oxidation of fossil carbon is sometimes termed geologic respiration. So it's the return of what was stable carbon back to the atmosphere uh, and in contrast with the biospheric uh, fate of sequestration of carbon. Um, and so more or less this is in balance. Um, and uh, and the, the, the controls on the delivery of organic carbon through the river system is largely driven by mineral uh, fluxes. And uh, as this very, uh, if you haven't read this paper, I definitely recommend it. My co-author is a lead author on this paper from a few years ago. Uh, Riverborne organic carbon fluxes are really strongly tied to mineral uh, fluxes and, and really, really you know, incredibly um, tight ways over lo many orders of magnitude. It's about a six order of magnitude scale there on the bottom axis. The left one is uh, petrogenic carbon and the right one is biospheric carbon, but the total flux is also tied. And this reflects uh, the fact that, petro uh, that fossil carbon or petrogenic carbon behaves like a, a, a weathered mineral. It sort of moves along with the minerals uh, from the source rocks. Um, and um, biological carbon is very much tied to the surfaces of minerals and carried by them. Um, and, and and also is tied, its transport is somewhat tied to soil disruption. Um, and there's some really open questions about how these uh, might interact or um, be influenced by particular localities or conditions. But nonetheless, over this large scale of flux, these are really tightly coupled. Um, so this lets, as a geologist, this lets me think uh, about the sort of time scales of these balance between the biospheric burial and the petrogenic carbon uh, oxidation. And we know from our colleagues in the surface um, process world, and this is a figure from a review article by Taylor Perrone uh, from a, a year ago, uh, that, um, that the, uh, the 
the disruption and the resetting of a landscape takes place on the scales of about 10,000 or so years. Um, and so a major abrupt climate perturbation will have sort of immediate response to perhaps in the carbon cycle, but it propagates over some period of time over the landscape before it resets it back to equilibrium. And so this leads me to wonder is if this sort of protracted time scale of resetting uh, perhaps knocks things out of balance on some, uh, some uh, transient period between the burial of uh, biological carbon and the oxidation of fossil carbon during the weathering process. To study that is actually uh, tricky. Um, we have kind of, we're in a kind of a renaissance of tools to study uh, fossil carbon in modern transport systems, and, and Valier and his colleagues have really been driving this, and in large measure due to the ability to make very precise radiocarbon measurements on individual structures. Um, and that allows us to sort of date molecules with great precision, and from that we can begin to understand the reactivity in the environment. To do that on geologic timescales is impossible because the radiocarbon uh, uh, tool is no longer useful. And so we turn our, instead to other more traditional biomarker proxies. For example, the proportion of these two compounds is very much a reflection of the heat exposure, the thermal maturity of a kerogen. And we can use these kinds of molecules at least to pull out this kerogen uh, component in a, uh, in a transported material. And using this kind of approach, uh, my student uh, Shelby Lyons uh, recently uh, has uh, uh, put together a record that shows that there's a destabilization and, and increased flux, uh, burial flux of this fossil carbon following the, the warm, uh, abrupt climate of the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, um, and that she used that, that enhanced flux of that carbon. Uh, from the fossil sources, if and assuming that it's being oxidized as it's transported so that what we get in the sediment is just the residual of a transported flux to estimate uh, the carbon dioxide release during that transport sort of surge. Um, and so we, we argue in this paper there's a transient surge in weathering, transport, and oxidation of uh, fossil carbon that uh, really is a consequence of an initial warming event that then propagates over tens of thousands of years. And there's some obvious lessons for modern climate um, uh, consequences on this, this time scale. But that's not the only tool that uh, might be useful, and I want to call uh, your attention to these compounds. These are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Many folks know these as contaminants and pollutants that we have to worry about. I see I'm almost out of time. I'm finishing, I promise. Um, and these, but these also have degrees of alkylation that tell us something about their origin, and we can distinguish the, uh, something from a fire versus something from a weathered uh, rock. And this, uh, this is work of uh, my student, Allison Karp, who's beginning to look at uh, the use of these compounds based on various re uh, ratios of the reactivity in the environment to distinguish origins of pyrogenic or fire and fossil carbon or petrogenic, and then the degrees of degradation along the transport process. And so the, this, the graph on the left shows samples up here from the Sawalik group in upland or uh, soil environments, and then these are distal marine sediments. And you can see this sort of movement from pyrogenic down to petrogenic down into degradation. And so we think there's a lot more information here to be unpacked, but it can help us uh, study these perturbations and their consequences. Okay, and I'll just end with my last slide, I promise. Um, <laughs> and that we, um, we have a lot that we don't know, and the weathering and erosion and carbon cycle feedbacks are not fully understood, partic understood particularly on these uh, sort of tens of thousands to million year time scales. We need new tools uh, to help us study that, and we also need to work in, in an interdisciplinary partnership with our, our, our colleagues who study landscapes, climate, and carbon cycle models. Thank you very much. Thank you. Indeed, eight minutes is a tough thing to do. All right, it's not all about carbon. It certainly isn't. So who's gonna, who's gonna fix the nitrogen cycle for us? Jim Galloway. <laughs> Thank you, Dork. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, since there are some carbon people Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, since there are some carbon people here, I'll be simple. Um, we are going to... <laughs> so Aladdin found this lamp, and there was a genie that gave Aladdin and his mother all the food they would ever want to have, and the wine. And we have a lamp that has a genie in it, 
It's called making converting unreactive N2 to reactive nitrogen. And our challenge is to how do you manage that reactive nitrogen because it is speeding up the pulse of the planet. So uh, you can read this as well as I can. Uh, this is just the history. The most important line is the bottom one. Where, how has this evolved from the way in the beginning to where we are now? And then I'm also going to look into the future. I'm going to start 2.7 billion years ago. Uh, that's when the, the best e evidence in, in Canfield Science paper was when biological or some process that converted uh, microbially mediated converted N2 to reactive nitrogen. And then about 500 years ago, uh, scientists, uh, mostly in the 18th and 19th centuries, learned how nitrogen, well, first of all, exists and how it cycles around uh, through the microbial systems, nitrification, denitrification. Great advancement. The little spaghetti diagram there is an interactive timeline that we've developed through the International Nitrogen Initiative. We're moving to the next more important, most important dates. Um, Sir William Crookes, president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, said in 1898, the civilized world is running out of nitrogen to grow wheat. And he challenged the chemist to solve the problem. The chemist and an engineer, German, responded, and they solved the problem. But it wasn't to make food. It was to make munitions to fuel, to uh, provide Germany with a way of blowing people up. So what about food? Let's talk about what nitrogen relates to food. So this diagram gives a bit about overconsumption. It shows eating, and it says, well, when you put this Haber-Bosch process into the mix of a combustion-formed uh, reactive nitrogen, how does that move through time? This diagram shows population, the red line, left axis, um, teragrams of nitrogen per year, reactive nitrogen creating, breaking that triple bond, N2 to reactive nitrogen, and you see uh, the Haber-Bosch process is here. This is uh, cultivation-induced uh, biological nitrogen fixation, think tofu, um, and then this is fossil fuel combustion. By the time that before most of the people in this room were born, 1950, 1960, humans became better than nature in converting N2 to reactive nitrogen. Now on a global scale, we humans create about three to five times more reactive nitrogen uh, than do natural terrestrial systems. So what happens to this reactive nitrogen once it's created? Part of my title of my talk is The Cascade. Here we have the Nitrogen Cascade published in 2003. And it just shows that once you break that triple bond and you put an atom of nitrogen, in, reactive nitrogen, in the environment, that it will move through Earth's systems, having uh, effects through the atmosphere, within the atmosphere, deposition into water systems, into soil systems. And this keeps on going until that reactive nitrogen uh, molecule finds a place that doesn't have much oxygen, where it can be denitrified back to N2. Unfortunately, there's places like that don't really exist that much. They're decreasing, uh, they're becoming more scarce. And so we are now accumulating on about a 50% per year basis uh, the reactive nitrogen in the environment. And so the question is, well, what do we do with that? How do we respond to that? Um, and most importantly, what's it gonna look like in the future? So uh, I am growing to this shape. Um, we are all about here, not necessarily in shape, but in advancement. And so when we look down 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 100 years, realizing that we need this reactive nitrogen to grow food, how are we going to manage that? Because, because of this, this cascading uh, properties of reactive nitrogen, there's some serious issues that are, keep accumulating. So here's a diagram of the reactive nitrogen creation rate in 1995. Uh, it shows these are teragrams per year. Um, this is total reactive nitrogen created by food and, uh, and uh, uh, production and energy consumption. And the total is 140. The per capita 
reactive nitrogen creation rate is 100 in North America. It's 24 for the whole world, 16 in Asia, and 6 kilograms of nitrogen per person in uh, Africa. What would it look like in the year 2050 if everybody in the world had the same reactive nitrogen creation rate as those of us in North America, which that was in this year was 100 kilograms of nitrogen per person per year, converting N2 to reactive nitrogen. This is not going to happen by 2050, but we are on the trajectory of every year creating more reactive nitrogen uh, to uh, fuel our bodies, to fuel our planet. And so what do you do? What do we do? This is a shared responsibility between the growers, the retailers, and the consumers. That, by the way, is my grandson, uh, <laughs> enjoying a nice <laughs> loaf of bread. I think he ate almost the entire thing. Um, my group, uh, my colleagues and I, focus on using on this uh, consumer, uh, not that consumer, but the consumer using nitrogen footprint tools. Through the project Endprint, uh, available on a variety of, of uh, platforms, we develop tools at the national, at the institutional, and at the city level. This is the national. We have 10 uh, country-level nitrogen footprints. We have five more uh, in progress. Uh, some of the people involved in this project are in this room, including one of my co-authors on this paper, Allison Leach. We develop uh, nitrogen footprint and carbon footprint tools together for institutions. And we, uh, they use that to manage the nitrogen. This is uh, becoming very popular. We started with one, now we have over 500 institutions. And for the first time ever, we have a nitrogen footprint tool for a city. The city of Baltimore, slightly to the north of us, uh, Elizabeth uh, Dukes, who is in this room, uh, has a poster uh, today, uh, poster 1558, where she explores the variability of nitrogen footprint within the census blocks of Baltimore. And um, you can see there's a large variability, and as that bullet says, nitrogen follows the dollars. The richer you are, the, more, the higher your nitrogen footprint. Fascinating story. The question is, what do you do with this information? What does the city of Baltimore do with this information? So, in summary, pretty good, huh? In some, pretty good, right? On time. Yeah. yeah, okay. In summary, it's easy, easy to solve the problem of reactive nitrogen creation by energy because that's a waste product. We have the tools, the political tools, the uh, economic tools, variety of tools to do this. Really difficult to solve the problem for food production. And I don't know how uh, we can do it now, but I am sure that through collective knowledge and collective work, we'll be able to do it such that by, by the year 2050 uh, or 2100, we're not creating 1,000 teragrams of reactive nitrogen a year by human activity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker putting it together, Bev Law. There went a minute, so I'm going to go fast. <clears throat> Get him out. Okay. All right. This is the current situation. We have multiple stressors. Starts with human population and overconsumption, and it goes from there. I'm going to focus on forests in particular to keep this down to now seven minutes, and um, and forests of the western U.S. There are different scales of analysis where we've made some headway, and uh, I'm also focusing on more recent work. Um, one of the things that we've done at plot level is we've been able to determine that we have been overestimating fire emissions for a long time, and now we have better data to improve those estimates, both on uh, landscape up to regional scale. The Ameriflux network has been running uh, many sites more than 20 years. There are measurements at those sites in addition to the above canopy fluxes. A combination of that, uh, say measurements on trees and on the ecosystem level, has shown that young forests in general um, are, are more sensitive to drought and heat, 
and we have enough data now to be able to see trends at sites such as uh, successional changes or when something like beetles come through or multiple years of drought. And then region, I bolded that because that's the scale we've been working at for a long time and we use data from all these other levels to get there. The recent conditions in the western U.S. is using satellite data and other observations. We looked at just biomass mortality from harvest, beetles, and fire. And on average, 50% of the biomass mortality in the western U.S. is from harvest. Then when you break it down to the subregions, you can see it varies. The beetles is more in the intermountain region it's, and so forth. But the harvest in northwest, the Pacific Northwest, that's Oregon and Washington, that upper western corner, is 80% of the biomass mortality. So that changes the canopy structure, changes the function, impacts wildlife. Future conditions. We decided to use the community land model because it has such great carbon and nitrogen linkages. And um, it's also appropriate. It has a built-in uh, fire model as well as a harvest model. And we've been using it really for more like uh, 10 or 15 years as it's grown and changed. But we re reduced the grid scale down to 4 by 4 kilometers so that the GCM uh, general circulation model inputs capture the variation in um, climate with the mountain range and so forth. Uh, we run it with major forest species rather than plant functional types. So we have 13 here. And then we improve drought sensitivity in the model by using a global data set on drought sensitivity by species. And then we've improved the fire model to work better at this kind of scale. A lot of the issues with the fire model is, uh, is the ignition sources. So we've looked at the future vulnerability of forest to mortality in the next few decades, and that's where we have more confidence in the input data that go into this as well as the testing data and uh, ran two models so that we, when both models agreed that there was high vulnerability to mortality, that's the pink. At the other end of the spectrum, low vulnerability to mortality over this time frame, the next 30 years, is blue. And uh, you notice that the pink is down around the four corners area for drought. Uh, they've been experiencing this in the past and have decadal droughts. It's just going to get worse. And then fire and so forth. This can go to, into decision making. One of the things that, that I heard in a, um, when I was in a Senate briefing is somebody from the Southwest said, Let, they're all going to die, the forests are going to die down there, let's cut them anyway. Well, there's a problem with that in that you've changed the microclimate and then you're going to change the biome and it could even get worse than that. Desertification. I'm going to focus on the good part of it, so where there's low vulnerability to mortality, that's the blue, so zooming in on Oregon. And we did a, st a paper on looking at different land use strategies to preserve forest carbon and to increase forest carbon. And we did this uh, for uh, up to year 2100. And one thing about the coastal forests, as I'm going to say, is a lot of the modeling that we've done in the testing, originally we did inverse modeling and Bayesian optimization and found the model that we were working, the early version, was greatly underestimating productivity and biomass in the coastal forests, and we fixed that issue. So effects of land use strategies. Um, I, we looked at afforestation, where it used to be forest more than 50 years ago, reforestation of areas that had been cut, such as in the picture. Um, or had experienced other disturbances. And then preserving uh, forest land on federal lands, just a portion of it, and then extending harvest cycles, doubling the harvest cycles. Now that sounds like a lot going from 40 to 80 years, but these are forests that can live 800 years. And uh, the harvest cycle was 80 to 120 years um, repeat cycle only about 10 to 20 years ago. And they're talking about going to shorter and shorter rotations. Now, what I was saying about young forests being more sensitive in this region, at least in the, from the wet to the dry systems, it suggests that might not be the way to go. So my last big plea is to link science to action at the right scales. Uh, you know, this regional is good for national decision making as well as, say, state level decision making. A lot of times they come to you or there, there are actions that are being taken before there's information, such as happened here. And the context matters. It's not the same everywhere. And we have policies that are being made that are very broad sweeping. It's do something everywhere. 
That's not the way it is. It's not, we need to be much more surgical about it. And science, scientists have to do more to give input on this. I'm gonna stop there. Caught you up, Steve. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Fabulous, thank you. Um, now, to take a bird's eye view of biogeochemistry, we have, I had already put mine up it should be there, it's all here, good, all here, you got it, keyboard mouse feet, all right, good, it's kind of hard to imagine how little we knew about global NPP when I started. And, and I find that one of the best ways to think about that, this is what Inez Fung knew about global NPP in 1983. And us lesser mortals knew even less than this. And so uh, we really, at that point in the early 80s, and that's when I had just arrived as a tree biology professor at Montana, this is the level of understanding of global NPP that we had at the time. And then there came this. Uh, Jim Tucker started processing global NDVIs. And uh, it's hard for an audience like this to imagine back then that we had really never seen the entire biosphere before. You think about it, before AVHRR, we had never seen the whole, the whole uh, Earth's surface at once. And suddenly here is this new NDVI uh, data set. And uh, Jim was getting a paper in a major journal almost every other month at the time. He had no competition. <laughs> and so he sent me some of this early NDVI data, for, and I was doing some early modeling of, uh, of uh, forest tra uh, transpiration and photosynthesis, and he sent me a data set, and uh, this graph is the one aha moment of my entire career. I still remember it to this day. I was in uh, Australia on sabbatical. I sucked this NDVI data into, would you believe, a Lotus 123 spreadsheet, which was the, what we had for uh, number crunching and graphics at the time, and I remember when this graph popped up and I immediately saw I don't know what this NDVI is but there's something to it that's worth finding out and from there on out I, I guess I spent the rest of my career trying to figure out what to do with NDVI. Now what I did as I started imagining how to scale uh, uh, our understanding of uh, transpiration, photosynthesis, and NPP from the plot levels, which at the time was where we had all our information. You know, this is decades before Fluxnet came along. And so we were so clueless. We'll remember Inez's picture there, just back. And so I thought, well, it looks like maybe NDVI will bring most of the biology I need. Maybe I can just do some simple climate scalers and uh, at a global scale have a pretty good first approximation of NPP. And so I put together um, simple scalers for, of course, day length and incident radiation comes from potential radiation models. Um, Temperature thresholds, the freezing threshold is one of the most fundamental things in all of biology when you th think about it. And then, of course, there is water stress, which uh, I knew way too much physiology, but I put very little of it into my modus algorithm, and some of the people in this audience have criticized me for years that all I use is a VPD control for water stress in the NPP algorithm. But by simply putting those three climate scalers together effectively with NDVI, that's how I came up with a, a global NPP that uh, is still being produced to this day. And uh, at one kilometer resolution, you compute 110 million cells per day for these algorithms. Now, I can't overestimate, in fact, let me, let me put it this way. 
When I wrote the proposal that got me my, my MODIS uh, funding, I did not even offer a validation. I just said, I think I can do this and compute a global NPP. I had no validate. I didn't even know how, I couldn't even imagine what I might propose. And then along came Fluxnet and saved my career. And uh, I really mean that, that Fluxnet gave me hard numbers of carbon balance around the world that I could then build a, a legitimate uh, validation logic around. Now, not too long ago, as uh, some of the ideas of planetary boundaries started getting popular, uh, and I looked at the trajectory uh, that we're seeing for global NPP, it, it occurred to me it kind of looked like NPP might be one of these planetary boundaries. So I suggested that in a, uh, a paper in Science a few years back. Uh, it wasn't too long before uh, people started criticizing that idea and showing that at least a some aspects of the biosphere uh, actually uh, do appear to be accelerating in carbon fixation. And so I, I think we still have uh, uh, you, uh, an, uh, an interesting question of how much of a, of a constraint global NPP might be. I think it's still a useful construct, though, to think that we do have some kind of up capacity of planetary NPP. What we're looking at now as we think forward in, in uh, our MODIS NPP data set is improving the biology. Now at long last I'm going to go back to some of the physiology I was trained in and try to figure out how we can put more uh, biology in a global algorithm. And so this is an example. We have posters here uh, that we're doing that. Uh, my recommendation that uh, I, I look for the future as I think back on the progress of remote sensing is this. Nowadays, we have so many things to choose from. We have spatial resolution down to 10 centimeters. We have temporal resolution. Now the new geostationary GOES satellites, you can get five minute temporal resolution uh, spectral, we, we're now having spectrometers that'll give you hundreds of channels. And my advice to uh, you graduate students is just because you can get that super resolution in space, time, spectra, don't just think that you should use it all. Because you may have the, the variability of your system just blow up in your face and you're trying to figure it out. And so I, I really think now that we have so many choices uh, uh, of how to do remote sensing of uh, the biosphere, think hard of how much resolution you really need because you have lots of choices and you don't necessarily just want to use the latest and greatest high resolution uh, imager because you may dig yourself into quite a mess. That's it from me. words. Now, Jake Wilson will tell us about the pulse of phenology. Uh, and there we are. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Chris, thank you. Well, I've been well set up here, and it's an honor to be part of this session. Uh, Steve, we call it the resolution revolution, and you're right. We have to be kind of careful about just following the revolution. Uh, I, I'm going to follow up. It's sort of a perfect uh, session here to, to, to be in. Um, I'd like to point out that I'm not 100% pandering to the title of the session. We've had the pulse of the planet or taking the pulse of the planet as our motto. Uh, you can check out our website uh, for about 11 years. The Phenology Network itself uh, was established in 2007 with resources from NSF and from U.S. Geological Survey. And the idea is to create a continental scale observatory, sort of an empirical perspective. So I'm going to be leveraging off of some of the talks here so far today. Uh, let's see, next slide. So the Phenology Network, of course, studied the timing of the life cycle events of plants and animals, uh, was designed to collect, store, and share information 
uh, that can be used for a variety of different kinds of applications, but hopefully to advance science at a, at, a, at a local to continental scale, inform natural resource decisions because we are funded by Department of Interior, and then to communicate and connect with observers who are in the field, with scientists, with resource managers who are making decisions. So we might move from the scale of an individual juniper all the way up to a landscape scale and into uh, developing forecasts for uh, uh, aeroallergens and human health. The Phenology Network actually emerged from early discussions and planning for the National Ecological Observatory Network, but we realized that there was an opportunity to sort of broaden the, the number of observations across the nation and use this multi-tiered monitoring framework that others have kind of alluded to, where we have intensive science sites. So NEON, for example, is using Phenology Network protocols for monitoring plants. We have extensive science sites like our DOI partners, Department of Interior partners like Park Service and Fish and Wildlife Service. We have volunteer and education networks that are participating. Actually, we use citizen scientists as a way to collect data at, uh, at a national to continental scale. And then we can stitch all this together with remote imagery and work together across these different scales. So the heart of the Phenology Network is our ground-based observing platform. We call it Nature's Notebook. Uh, it's our 10th anniversary uh, this, this year for the network as well as for the observing uh, uh, platform, really, where we now have not only individuals and partners collecting, but we have partner groups. So over 400 partner groups uh, submitted data last year. We have thousands of sites and standardized protocols published for uh, 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 thousands of species. Uh, about 1,200 species or so, tens of thousands of observers contributing data across the nation, and now we just reached 15 million records this, this uh, week. So what, we, what does it look like then? We have wall-to-wall -wall data. It was envisioned as a wall-to-wall -wall network uh, supplementing, complementing NEON and beyond, and so we have observations going back to about 1958 all across the nation used for a variety of different purposes, which I'll describe in a few minutes. So what do we do with all this data? Well, not only can we create products that go back to our observers like calendars or simple tools to understand the relationships between phenology and environmental drivers, but we can create, uh, create and scale up those data into uh, something like this, which is a, an anomaly of, of, a, of an index of spring. So we have the spring index that we rolled out last spring. Um, it was a really early spring, got a lot of attention in the media. And so this is an anomaly product that shows, for example, at the kilometer scale, but sp again, scaling up, that it was sort of a late spring in the southern tier, uh, really early, up to three weeks early in the mid-Atlantic, and then everybody was waiting for spring in the upper Midwest, uh, and it was a very late spring. So we could start to scale this information and deliver it via APIs to relate to things like NDVI or to aeroallergens, et cetera. I have actually two model, two validation slides in my talk, uh, which I'm very proud of. One is that we can actually then use a, create and use a variety of tools. These are actually on our, off of our website, so it's just sort of a screen capture. And this is where we can take our observational data from across the nation on different taxa and compare it to the model forecast predictions or forecasts. Uh, so, for example, we're comparing uh, our data for a uh, lilac observing network to prison-based um, observations, and we can do observed minus expected and kind of come up with an assessment of plausibility, decide, okay, where are the gaps, where do we need to improve our models, how do we move towards data model assimilation, is that going to be an advantage or not? We also have some NSAT products that we can relate things to. But then we can also take the, the, the data and relate it to other kinds of observing platforms. So going back to the triangle diagram that I showed a few minutes ago, how do we integrate across those different, those different scales? So this is the paper that just came out uh, in uh, remote sensing and of the environment. Uh, Zhang et al. were developing the new um, uh, VIRS product, the NBAR uh, VIRS product, and said, well, we need some way to, to validate the, the data, the, uh, our, our, our new product. And so they used the data in the upper left from uh, this is 2013 and 2014, data from the entire phenology network, and then just a couple of species, and are using that again as a validation tool for these new products that are being developed. So we can, again, work across these different scales and actually build in validation as we go. I'd like to also point out, too, that going cycling back around in, in that triangle again is that we've been working with NEON on the development of their plant phenology obser observation system. So the protocols are essentially the same as what we use at the phenology network. The data are now interoperable. Uh, they're exchanged via APIs. And we'll be developing higher order or level four data products for NEON that will be available through the USANPN website. 
showing, uh, showing a, a variety of different kinds of data products. We also can then take the data and relate it, create real world applications. Uh, so this is, for example, an emerald ash borer uh, forecast for that's delivered at the national scale within the range, uh, the known range of emerald ash borer, which is uh, a noxious invasive uh, insect that um, that uh, is uh, is decimating uh, many many different kinds of forest uh, trees. Um, and we can deliver it to resource managers in a variety of different ways that says, okay, emerald ash borer, you would expect it to be uh, active at this particular location uh, across the nation. And since this is a forecasting tool where we use NCEP data and we can have short-term forecasts, we can actually say, okay, guess what? You should start preparing for how you're going to go out and manage and detect emerald ash borer. So where do we go over the course of the next decade? So we're 10 years in on a national phenology network for the US. We've been sharing our information out with other countries in the world. So Bhutan is thinking about a national phenology network. Sweden has a national phenology network. But over the course of the next decade here, we have a number of other applications relating and forecasting uh, information for invasive species, migratory organisms or insects like monarch butterflies, disease vectors like mosquitoes or ticks, arrow allergens. How do you inform ecological restoration and when do you know it's good and also adaptation to changing environments. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. It's been wonderful to be here. Unbelievably, we're very close to on time. That's fabulous. Um, okay. So Michael Gusev will um, take us down the river, going to the flow. Bev, I apologize for jumping up earlier. I was so nervous about following Jim Galloway in a session. Apparently, I just thought I was literally following him. So, all right. Um, this is a little bit different, obviously, than um, what we've talked about to date or to, to um, up to this moment in this session. But I, I wanted to try to um, convince you that uh, we have new and different ways of trying to understand how water quality evolves down rivers and um, in. Uh, uh, river systems, and we can think about that in the context of trying to better understand biogeochemical processing in rivers and water quality as it comes to uh, regulation. Um, so one of the things that we can do, uh, if we go to the USGS, we can download data and look at discharge, we can look at uh, temperature, maybe electrical conductivity, in a few places we also have dissolved oxygen, and we, we can look at those changes through time. When we do that in sort of this Eulerian uh, framework, we can think a bit about, um, we have to use our imagination to try to understand what we're really integrating upstream of this that provide the changes in time at this location. We can also conduct synoptic surveys. We can walk along streams, gather samples as we go, and try to put together a snapshot. Again, we haven't really necessarily connected these dots. Ideally, we, we collect these close enough so that we don't have to make huge assumptions about what's happening in between. This can be um, fairly labor intensive, and we often try to do it from downstream up because we don't want to sample any impact we've had, particularly on small streams. However, um, we don't really follow a parcel of water when we do this and look at its evolution. And so um, this notion that, that was published uh, uh, last year by Scott Ensign and, and uh, Martin Doyle um, basically gets at this point of what if, we, what if we got in the river and followed the, the parcel of water as it evolved? What if we put together um, all the pieces and tried to understand the evolution as we move downstream? And that's where we can, we don't have to use our imagination quite as much anymore. And we can, if we are uh, uh, trying to manage water quality across broad scales in a state, we can think carefully about um, some of the distinct changes that occur and try to understand how we can um, perhaps come up with management strategies uh, to change those if needed. All right, so um, I'm going to provide a little example here uh, from this past summer. Uh, Matt Cohn and I have this wonderful project funded by the National Science Foundation to try to um, test the river continuum concept using in situ sensors and Lagrangian techniques. So we are moving with the water. Um, we do have a number of Eulerian uh, stations set up in the upper Colorado River Basin. Um, I'm just going to show uh, for, for this particular expedition, we spent uh, 10 days on the river. We floated about 215 miles. We also set out a number of, of fixed stations where we had a huge complement of um, expensive sensors that we left for two weeks hoping everything would be fine. Um, I'm only going to show you data from since we, uh, there it is, um, from the lowest one just below Moab. This is the Potash USGS gauge, um, which was our lowest point uh, that we floated on the river. Um, while we were on the river, we were um, 
collecting a number of in-situ parameters. The one, th one difference between the two uh, data sets is that we could not carry with us uh, our um, uh, phosphate sensors, um, so we left those in place to do their sort of wet chemistry in place. But um, our high frequency data collection meant that we had very few gaps as we were moving. Um, the slowest sensor that we had running was one minute, and it was um, the dissolved oxygen sensor. Now, ideally, but less fun, we could have automated systems that we put into the river, move with the flow, collect all this data for us, get GPS locations, et cetera, and we could back that out. Um, uh, Scott uh, actually developed a prototype for this, but it is not something in uh, massive production that we can all go buy off the shelf and throw into the river. So we must raft, and that's okay. Uh, that's a lot of fun. All right, so this is a map of the upper Colorado River Basin. And as we move downstream, um, we see a big change in the surroundings. We go from the, the um, upper mountains into uh, dry uh, western landscapes, semi-arid. As we move further down into uh, sort of the Colorado-Utah border, it uh, becomes even drier and redder. And eventually, we get down to um, the Moab area. And if you were also paying attention to the river color, it has changed as well. We have a lot more um, suspended sediment here in the river, and um, and yet, in, in temperatures, I'll uh, take away some of my punchline here for a moment, temperatures up to 28 degrees C, and yet fish were still jumping, uh, probably to try to find cooler water, I'm not really sure, but in any event, um, at our fixed site, um, what I'll show you here, so this is about two weeks of data. Um, if, you, if we follow this, there are a whole bunch of parameters. I'm just going to highlight a couple of these. Towards the end of this period, at the lowest part of our, our reach, um, we see a, a big flow uh, come through, a small one here, and then a big one. And I think these are two different storms that occurred um, as we were rafting. Um, we'll move down here, and I'll just highlight uh, some of the response in dissolved oxygen and uh, CO2 in this plot. Um, but what's interesting is if we go to the next one, we see a turbidity spike with the smallest of these flow perturbations, the first storm that comes through. Um, and then we see um, a pretty interesting shift in um, the, the points there are the nitrate, uh, in situ nitrate uh, sensor data. And we see a really nice diurnal uh, variation right after that. Um, and yet uh, a big step up in our, um, our phosphate after that second um, high flow event. However, that's using our imagination. I said, I think those are two storms. This is what happened as we were floating. Now, it turns out the University of Colorado will not allow me to take graduate students out um, floating in the river at night. So every day, we were out for about six, eight hours. We got off the river. So we couldn't continuously follow the exact same parcel of water. But um, these, so these gaps, uh, there's a few gaps here that indicate um, where, where we got out of the river or where we had um, rapids that we did not want to uh, risk our, our expensive sensors in. But every day you can see the temperature warm up as we were moving downstream. You can see dissolved oxygen increase um, as we were moving downstream as well. So this is uh, uh, the uh, metabolism in the stream showing its colors. Um, we see CDOM changing, and every one of these uh, triangles is um, an inflow. And so in particular, this is the Gunnison River coming in uh, right above or right in the town of uh, Grand Junction. And what happens below that is there's a lot of water that is removed from the Colorado River. It is spread across agricultural fields. It comes back. And so we see um, an appreciable increase in uh, uh, specific conductance here, the electrical conductivity of the river, um, as we move down uh, through this, this region. And of course, that stays elevated uh, as we go further down. The other thing that was happening in the last two days here is we did find a sediment plume that we would start in in the morning. We'd actually end up rowing ahead of it. And then uh, we found it the second morning, actually, so this turbidity was quite high. So ultimately, we can um, try to link the evolution of water um, when we use these techniques. And um, I think it, it allows us to um, move, move back towards uh, thinking about the true evolution of water as it moves downstream and trying to pull dynamics where we're integrating through both space and time and not just one or the other. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle well, Mack is going to disturb the Arctic for us. Got it. Good to go. Right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay, can I do it with the mouse? Can I advance? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, in the high northern latitudes, in the boreal forests, and in the Arctic tundra, where I work, 
you all know that climate is warming more than twice as fast as it is anywhere else on Earth. And there's ample circumpolar evidence that ecosystems, that the ecology of the landscape is responding to this warming. And we often think of these relatively slow ecological processes like shrubs moving into graminoid tundra or trees moving into tundra. Um, and if I was technologically savvy, I would maybe show you a video of moss growing slowly. But today I want to talk about rapid change and fast changes in a disturbance agent that is triggered by weather and is increasing with warming climate. And so we know that wildfire has by far the largest footprint of any natural disturbance agent in the high northern latitudes. And these fires are started by lightning and they burn most cases in wildlands. Um, we have evidence that with climate warming, the footprint of fire is growing in the high northern latitudes. In the boreal forests of western North America, the area burned is increasing by about 0.3 million hectares per year. And we know that in some regions, at least from the paleo record, that this rate of burning exceeds the historic rates during the Holocene. So fires are burning more area. They're burning more deeply into the thick organic layers that characterize these ecosystems. And they're returning more frequently to the same place in space. And this is increasing risks to infrastructure, risks to human health. It's creating new complexity for land managers that might be managing for subsistence resources or for military use of land. And it's altering the structure and the function of the terrestrial ecosystems where I work. Um, in addition to expanding in the boreal region, we know that fire is turning up in new places where it doesn't have as long of a history. Um, on the north slope of Alaska, this is a picture of the Anatubic River fire that burned in 2007 and surprised us. It went from a lightning strike and a sort of fizzling fire that was smoldering in really wet soils to a fire that expanded almost up to the coastal plain on the North Slope. And we know that this happened because a high pressure ridge sat up in the late part of the growing season, and that high pressure was associated with both a reduction in sea ice cover and changes in circulation in the Arctic Ocean. So soils dried, surfaces dried, and tundra burned. And this fire, you can see the scar here, was unprecedented in that area. It was the first fire in 3,000 years. And here's a picture of all the boreal fires to the south. So we're thinking about a borealization of Arctic tundra fire regimes, a return perhaps in the future to a shorter fire return interval. So in the cases of a warming triggered disturbance like wildfire, there's the potential that arises for feedbacks between the biosphere and the atmosphere to emerge from the system. And we know that this increasing temperature is triggering more fire. Fire is transferring carbon from these ecosystems to the atmosphere, as well as other things, nitrogen, particulates. Um, and this is an immediate and potentially positive feedback to climate. But we also know that fire alters other controls over carbon inputs, plant productivity, even plant composition. And it also alters fire outputs via post-fire decomposition and maybe even the thaw and exposure of permafrost carbon. So we know that carbon, if it's lost during a fire, is not replaced over the next fire interval. This would result in a positive feedback to climate over the disturbance cycle. But that might be offset by some of these ecological changes that we see following fire. So a key question is, how are these changing fire regimes affecting carbon cycling feedbacks in the ecosystem? And I think it's an exciting question because it brings together plant ecology and things like mosses with biogeochemistry and earth systems. All right, so what are we learning? We're learning that high severity burning and larger areas burning are increasing carbon emissions to the atmosphere. We're learning that deeper burning 
of these organic soils is actually mining old carbon that is a legacy of past fires and it's shifting ecosystems in some cases from a net carbon sink to source over the disturbance cycle. We know that exposure of mineral soil promotes assembly of novel plant communities and in some cases these alter the post-fire carbon dynamics in such a way that it actually increases carbon storage on the landscape. And then finally, the, the area that we probably know the least about is how the removal of that insulating organic layer actually can lead to permafrost thaw, the formation of thermocarst structures as ground ice melts and soil surfaces collapse, and the promotion of loss of old permafrost carbon, so a, a disturbance interaction. All right, so my last slide here is to show you a conceptual models of the pathway, the pathway that we've discussed. Um, this is one of the focal areas of the NASA Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment, and we hope by the end of this decadal field experiment that we'll be able to put both sign and magnitude on these feedbacks for North American boreal forest and Arctic tundra. And through this process, we hope that we will better understand the transformations that are occurring in high northern latitude ecosystem driven by fast pulse disturbances like wildfire. And with this information, we can plan for and adapt to a future Arctic. Thank you. Okay, now, um, Julie Huber will take us down to get microbial. So I have the awkward job of transitioning us from land to the ocean. I also think I misunderstood the directions. There is no data in this talk, so sit back and, and relax. Um, I'm an oceanographer. I study microbial life at the bottom of the ocean, and I've spent the last 20 years staring at the bottom of the ocean, and this video I'm showing you is one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen. Uh, this is a volcano called Daikoku. It's located along the Mariana Arc, where the Pacific Plate is subducting, and as it melts, it creates these really gassy, acidic, uh, completely bizarre arc volcanoes that are spewing out molten sulfur. Um, it was remarkable for the scientists on board to see this, but we also live streamed this video uh, through embedded in Facebook back to land uh, aboard the Schmidt Ocean Institute's research vessel. And one of the most common questions we got as we streamed this video back was, is this Earth? So it's impossible not to look at images like this from our own planet and start to draw uh, parallels to other solar bodies. And in this example, this is um, Io, one of Jupiter's moons, which is the most volcanically active uh, planetary body in our solar system, and it too is covered in sulfur. And so this is just one example where we can make these analogies, draw these parallels between what's happening at the bottom of the ocean and what might be happening um, outside of Earth. We now know that we are not alone in having an ocean, that there are ocean worlds in our solar system. Um, and I think that this is an amazing search for life beyond Earth, and we're trying to answer the question of does biology work beyond Earth? In my lab at an oceanographic institution, however, we are first trying to understand how life works here at the bottom of the ocean. And this includes answering some really fundamental questions about how geology shapes life in our oceans, how does life survive without sunlight, what limits life, um, and of course, how does life spread and diversify all the way from the bottom of the ocean up to the terrestrial biosphere, and really trying to answer the question of whether or not life is unique or common in the universe. I just want to make sure, though, that I'm clear that I think when most of us who are studying life in these extreme environments are also thinking about life beyond Earth, we're focusing on microbial life, those two domains in the bacteria and the archaea. We know that for most of Earth's history, it's a microbial story. It was not until the evolution of oxygeni oxygenic photosynthesis that allowed multicellular, uh, more complex life to form. However, these microbes, you know, surround and immerse our world. They're incredibly important for both the biogeochemistry of our planet as well as our human health. 
but I'm not just interested in them because they're awesome, even though they are totally awesome, um, but also because they are intimately linked to our existence on this planet. And so as we're searching for life beyond Earth, we need to keep in mind we might be capturing another planetary body in its own planetary evolution. If it is only microbial life, that does not mean it will always stay that way. And I think that's important to keep in mind. So in these expeditions we've taken to the bottom of the ocean over the last you know, 20, 30 years, we have defined some requirements for microbial life. And I've just listed a couple of them here where organisms need a chemical disequilibrium with, to exploit, and I'll show you some examples of that. They need liquid water and a, a number of environmental parameters of which to live in. And here I'm just showing one example of the known temperature limit for life. That doesn't mean it can't be higher, um, but this is the known limit at this time. Uh, work by me and many others have contributed to really pushing the frontiers for limits of life in the world's oceans, including the existence of microbial life two and a half kilometers beneath the seafloor, microbes thriving in volcanic eruptions, and really expanding that tree of life um, as we look in more diverse environments. So the fact that life can exist in all these extreme environments at the bottom of the ocean has to do with this really fundamental reaction taking place, and it's been happening since our planet was formed. And that is seawater reacts with rock to create chemistry, chemical energy. Um, these are examples of a bunch of different places on the seafloor, um, many of which I've had the privilege of visiting. And they all look different, and their underlying rocks and chemistry are different, which means they then look different. Um, and this reaction of seawater reacting with rock creates energy sources that microbial life can exploit. And I put a question mark there because there are places on our planet that are energy rich, but life cannot survive because some of those other parameters whether it's temperature or pH or something like that, uh, do not exist. So I just want to walk you through an example of what this looks like on our planet and how we might use this chemical energy guide to help us look for life beyond. Um, but this is not real chemistry, so it's not stoichiometrically balanced. Don't freak out. Um, it's an eight-minute talk. So I just want to show you some examples of um, the energy sources that microbes can gain from rocks and seawater. So what I'm showing in here are nine metabolisms of microbes that uh, I can commonly detect in different environments on the seafloor. Uh, not always all of them, often just a subset of them, depending on where we are. And when they do the electron pass, this is what the equation looks like. So this is what it looks like in our modern ocean, at the bottom of the ocean. But now let's assume we're somewhere very far away from the sun and that we don't have photosynthesis. Therefore, we eliminate all those metabolisms associated with oxygen. And now we're in an anaerobic world, much like our early Earth. So now let's take away, we heard from Jim about nitrogen. We're gonna, let's take away that nitrate. We know that in early Earth's history, for example, we didn't have nitrate. We didn't have abundant nitrate. Uh, and now we're, we're stuck with these three anaerobic metabolisms. We have sulfate, we have hydrogen, uh, we have methane. Now, in fact, um, these metabolisms could potentially exist here on Jupiter's moon Europa. Uh, remember, I, I showed you Io spewing all that sulfur into the Jovian system. Uh, it's believed that there is sulfate on this icy shell of Europa and potentially water rock reactions creating hydrogen at the bottom of that ocean. But what if we don't have sulfate? That leaves us with this one thing, methanogenesis. Methanogenesis is a fascinating metabolism. I could give, give a great eight minute talk about that. Um, it's carried out by the domain archaea and they exist everywhere from cow guts to the bottom of the ocean. And at the bottom of the ocean, they're using hydrogen and CO2 to make methane. Well, when the Cassini mission through, flew through the flumes of Enceladus, they detected hydrogen, CO2, and methane. Now, it's important to note that there's no methanogen on Earth that we know of that could live in the conditions um, that are estimated for this plume of Enceladus. It's way too cold. The pH is too high. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, of course. It means maybe we haven't found it. But it's also possible that at the bottom of Enceladus's ocean, there are warmer environments, perhaps different pH conditions that do support life. I also think it's important to remember that if we did a Cassini flyby of Earth, we would probably never imagine that there's volcanoes spewing molten sulfur out at the bottom of the seafloor, there's giant tube worms, there's furry crabs. Um, I mean, there's crazy stuff going on at the bottom of the ocean that's out of sight and it's out of mind. But as we sort of begin this search for looking for life on ocean worlds, I think we have to remember that there's a lot more work to do here in our oceans to help us in that search. Thank you.
indeed, eight minute talks. By the way, not my idea. <laughs> All right, Matt Long's gonna take us down to the polar oceans. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to continue in the theme of, of oceanography here and give an overview of, uh, uh, of how, the, how the polar oceans function as biogeochemical systems. So a starting point for this is really just an examination of the geometry, the physical geometry of these systems, and a contrast between the Arctic, which is characterized by very broad continental shelves and an enclosed basin with passageways that uh, restrict exchange with the global ocean, in contrast with the Southern Ocean, which is a ice-covered continent surrounded by water and the only place on the planet where we have a truly circumpolar flow. Um, in these, 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 this fundamental geometry sets up differing dynamics that are essential to characterizing these systems. So for instance, in the Arctic, benthic pelagic coupling is a dominant mechanism sustaining ecosystems on the continental shelves. And we think a lot about mechanisms that promote cross-shelf exchange between the open basin and the continental shelf seas. In the Southern Ocean, by contrast, we have circumpolar flow that is steered by bathymetry and, an, and a secondary meridional overturning circulation that mediates the exchange of properties in the deep ocean with the atmosphere. These are polar systems, and so they're characterized by extensive sea ice cover, but the nature of that sea ice cover differs between the systems. In the, in the Arctic, uh, there's perennial ice cover, and as a result, a predominance of ice that has ages in, in uh, multiple years, eight ages. Whereas in the Antarctic, the system, most of the ice disappears annually in, in the system, and this results in uh, a, a much younger ice population. These systems are strongly forced by atmospheric dynamics. This plot shows sea level pressure, the mean sea level pressure uh, in each system on the, on the left. And as you can see, the circumpolar flow over the Southern Ocean is a dominant force driving ocean dynamics. The variability of this flow is also dynamic. Fluctuations in atmospheric variability persist over a broad range of spectra from synoptic scale storms that force event scale dynamics to multi-decadal multi variability in the southern annular mode or the North Atlantic oscillation. The winds drive dynamic currents. These are results from a global eddy resolving simulation that we've conducted at NCAR. And as you can see, there's substantial variability in the surface kinetic energy field um, in both these systems. Though, admittedly, the Southern Ocean is much more dynamic. This circumpolar flow is arranged into energetic jets. These jets have meanders. They're steered by bathymetry. They break off due to baroclinic instability and form eddies. And those eddies have an impact on the dynamics of the surface ocean with respect to exchange with the atmosphere. They are also a mechanism that controls surface ocean biology. So indeed, we see mesoscale variability evident in, the, in uh, an image like this, which is from the Arctic, the Ch Chukchi Sea. And we see the influence of, of, of mesoscale variability in stirring large-scale gradients of phytoplankton in the water column, as well as promoting or suppressing their growth due to mechanisms modulating vertical exchange. So for instance, here is a correlation between anomalies in sea surface height and anomalies in surface chlorophyll over, over the Southern Ocean. Where the picture is red, we see positive correlations between positive, those are positive anomalies in sea surface height. Those are associated with anticyclonic features, anomalous mass in the water column. And the mechanism here is that anticyclonic mesoscale features are associated with the depression in the mixed layer depth. And so what's happening in the Southern Ocean is that anomalous mixed layer depth taps into subsurface iron supply and stimulates phytoplankton blooms in anticyclonic features. That correlation largely switches sign in winter when the, when the most limiting resource is no longer iron, but rather light. 
So what I've presented here is a view of these systems that is really an Earth system perspective. The, the function of these systems entails coupling between the atmosphere, the ocean, between life in the ocean, and other components of the Earth system, such as continental scale ice sheets. And we really need to adopt this Earth system perspective in order to understand the trajectory of these systems into the future. So I'm just going to highlight a couple prominent results or features, uh, 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 signals of change that we observe. These plots show monthly mean standardized sea ice anomalies. This is a very familiar signature. It's sort of the poster child of climate change in the Arctic with rapid declines in sea ice. The Antarctic is a more mixed signal. We see it actually increases until the most recent period of the record. What's the future? Well, here are results from a global Earth system model a large ensemble of such a model that show in the coming decades we can expect the Arctic to become ice-free. What are the implications of an ice-free Arctic for changes in ocean biogeochemistry? There will be changes in the seasonality. There will be changes in the mechanisms that affect trophic coupling in the ocean. Moving to the Antarctic, some of the dominant signals of change we see here are actually abyssal warming rates. The abyss in the Southern Ocean is warming faster than anywhere else on the planet. We also see that waters in the abyss are becoming fresher, likely a, a result of uh, freshwater contributions from continental ice. As I said earlier in the talk, the Southern Ocean is a place that mediates the exchange of deep water properties with the atmosphere. That exchange is mediated by the meridional overturning circulation. So, su prop uh, surface surface processes in the Southern Ocean basically control the, con the, the content of the deep ocean with respect to heat and carbon. But this system is changing as a result of CO2 and ozone forcing. This plot shows results from another system model, projections of the zonal mean, zonal maximum wind stress over the Southern Ocean. The westerly jet will accelerate over the coming decades. What are the, what are the, what, how will the ocean respond? Will the mesoscale eddies compensate for meridional over to compensate for accelerations in Ekman, Ekman flow. So, some key questions. How will this coupled system evolve due to the broadband, you know, due to the combination of force change and broadband natural fluctuations? What is the future of CO2 uptake? How will primary productivity result, evolve? How will changes in net primary productivity and other marine stressors affect ecosystems into the future? and then some common challenges that I'll leave for you to read. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Estella Atacuana, is going to make us biogeophysical. Okay, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to be able to bring some geophysics to a biogeoscience session. And probably many of you are wondering what is, bio, what is geophysics doing in this session. Um, so many of us know that geophysics has played a very important role um, in the advancement of our understanding of the interior of the Earth from geophysical imaging. And what I'd like to do today is to be able to demonstrate to you that geophysics can play an equally important role in our advancement of uh, biogeosciences. So what is biogeophysics? Most people usually would ask me that. And essentially what we are doing with biogeophysics is trying to understand how microorganisms are able to change the physical properties of the subsurface and how we can use that to understand something about you know, the uh, biogeochemistry of the subsurface. And so what I'd really like to do with this talk is to, uh, since many people do not really know what uh, this biogeophysics is all about, is to be able to give you a little bit of a snapshot as to some of the advancements that have taken place in this field over the last you know, 20 years and hopefully convince those of you in the audience who are working in biogeochemistry and geomicrobiology that you ought to consider interfacing geophysics with some of your studies. And so, um, and this slide that I have here really is 
Uh, this paper was published by Sock et al. in 1998, almost you know, 20 years ago, and was a real game changer, and demonstrated for the first time that uh, microbial interactions with, subsur with this subsurface can in fact change physical properties that can be imaged using conventional geophysical techniques. So in this example, is at the hydrocarbon contaminated environment where the breakdown of the hydrocarbons by the bacteria produces organic acids and these acids then weather the aquifer materials releasing ions that go into solution essentially elevating the electrical conductivity. And so we're able to image that with the ground penetrating radar and we see an attenuation of the signals and we see also, this is an image of electrical resistivity, that the region of contamination is actually conductive. So this was a real game changer because, and, and resulted in a paradigm shift in our understanding that geophysics is, can not only sense, does not only sense uh, physical, the physics and the chemistry of the rock, but also the biology of the rock. So, if you want to learn a little bit more, a paper was published in 2009, which is a review paper, and really documents some of these findings. And so what can really geophysics do for uh, people who are working in biogeochemistry? Here's our traditional approach, is to be able to drill wells, many of them, to try to understand. But this is, of course, limiting. It's quite expensive, and you only get discrete data. Whereas with the geophysics, you can get continuous data, very high resolution. You can actually image areas in the subsurface where a lot of these biogeochemical hot zones are, and then be able to understand a lot about what's happening. So what I'd like to do now is just show you some snapshots of some major discoveries that have been made um, in terms of geophysics and geomicrobiology. So in this example here, what we are demonstrating for this study by Melage et al. is that we can actually use a low frequency electrical properties measurement to detect not only the presence of uh, microorganisms in the subsurface, but also be able to determine the abundance. And in the next slide, it's even more fascinating because we can also tell something about the metabolic state of the bacteria. So in this particular case, uh, the production of nitrite during uh, nitrate reduction is toxic to the cells, and we see the green is the geophysical data, and you can clearly see that in the region where you have this toxicity, there's a reduction in the biomass as well as a reduction in uh, the low frequency electrical measurements. Um, in this example, we also demonstrate here that not only electrical properties can sense the presence of microorganisms, but even seismic. And in this particular case, biofilms uh, in the subsurface results in significant attenuation of the seismic wave energy, as you can see here. So here's an experiment for day one, and by day five, you see a significant reduction in the amplitude of the seismic wave energy. And so people would typically ask, what about in the field? Can you really upskill these uh, observations in the field? And we say, yes. So here's an example from a landfill site, landfill leachate, and we're looking at shear wave velocity image in the subsurface. So the, here's the horizontal, and this is with depth. And right here, within the water table fluctuation zone, where we have, uh, and this happens to be the most biogeochemically active region within the subsurface, in this example, we see that the presence of biofilms actually causes an increase in the shear wave velocity. In this other example, we're looking at uh, magnetic susceptibility, which senses the presence of magnetic minerals in the subsurface. And we see this again at another site where within the water table fluctuation zone, and this happens to be a hydrocarbon contaminated environment, we see an excursion in the magnetic susceptibility which says that we have magnetite which is precipitated within this environment, within this zone. And uh, with environmental microbiology data, we're able to demonstrate, surprisingly, that this interface is not really uh, colonized by a dominance of ion-reducing re microorganisms, but rather methanogens, which raises important questions. Is the magnetite enhancing methanogenesis, or are the methanogens producing the magnetite? So, uh, examples of studies like this can really begin to push our understanding of uh, geomicrobiology. And this is another example here showing in peatlands that we can use geophysical measurements to be able to 
tell the concentration of methane gas that is produced uh, by, you know, biogenic gas distribution, as you can clearly see, and this is uh, from ground penetrating radar, and from this we're estimating, it's, uh, they're able to estimate the distribution of methane gas within the subsurface. So looking into the future, uh, if you ask me where do I think we see biogeophysics going, I really think there's a, there's a chance for us to be able to interface with astrobiology studies. And so it is an example that we know that we have the NASA InSight Mars Lander, and it's going to be conducting the first geophysical investigations uh, on Mars. And the question then is, can we in fact also uh, put geophysical sensors on some of these landers to look for microbial life on Mars? And as well as the deep ocean, Julius just been talking about, we want to know who's down there, what are they doing, and how, how many of them are present. And I've already demonstrated to you that we're able to detect the presence of microbial cells as well as estimate their abundances. So I think the future is open and exciting to be able to interface geophysical measurements with these type of studies, but it's really going to require some innovative thinking and true collaborations with the um, uh, environmental microbiologists and biogeochemists. Thank you. Okay. Next, Rick Cole is going to expand our lives. Thank you to the organizers for convening this session. And uh, okay, we're underway. So, okay, okay. Right to this. It's okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, I'd like to start by uh, returning as Julie started us going in the direction of the subsurface, uh, similar to what Estella was just talking about, um, and having you think a little bit about time scales and, uh, well, the sorts of time scales that geologists pay attention to, that we pay attention to, but also that really um, matter for microorganisms. So on this plot, uh, just right through the middle of the plot is our time scale that goes from a few seconds to uh, about a million years. And shown in purple are uh, geologic processes, some of which we might be very familiar with, like, uh, the period of eruption of Old Faithful, if you've been to uh, Yellowstone. On the other end of the spectrum are really short geologic processes, the duration of the last ice age, at least as geologists would say to see this. And then if you look at uh, human processes in red, many of these we're concerned with on an immediate basis. Some of them we think about sometimes, the radioactive waste that we've uh, created and how we might try to store it. Uh, and that's about, I mean, sometimes we think about more, but in our immediate lives, it's quite brief. Microorganisms span all the way from uh, processes that are on the order of a few seconds, the lifetime of messenger RNA, but the longest lived ones or estimated microbial doubling times are quite a bit longer. So you can see that microorganisms uh, span this, this distance. Now, what controls these processes in Earth systems, we are beginning to understand, of course. And I'd highlight a couple of these. Uh, Julie referred to uh, thermodynamic disequilibria or redox reactions, certainly chemical processes upon which microbial life depends. And we've studied this in many subsurface environments. We understand it quite well in most cases. At the opposite end of this spectrum of various Earth pro processes that dictate life, maybe not so much in the subsurface, but life in general, are things like seasons, which we can watch. Now, what I've shown in red are things that I think are fairly well understood. We might uh, discuss whether we actually do understand them well and how they control earth processes or biogeochemical processes. But I've shown in black a number of things that we might think about, begin to think more carefully about, that do, do control life processes, almost certainly in the subsurface, but for which we still have not much evidence. 
One that I'll talk about a little bit more is seismicity. And I, I would point out that whenever I come to this meeting and I just stand around, maybe walk through a poster session, I can repopulate this, this figure with new processes just because I've heard geologists talk about them usually or geophysicists talk about them. And I had no way of imagining them as a microbiologist. Now Everett Schock would look at this question in terms of power that cells require. And uh, he would say that uh, there's a certain power demand for cells uh, and a power supply that comes from the environment. And under the right conditions, cells would find themselves in a habitable place. But if the demand is too high, then it's a, a relatively uh, unhabitable place. And on the margins, are the extremes. What we really don't understand in some cases or in many cases is how extreme and for how long these organisms, organisms can survive there. So in this plot it shows this one-to-one -one relationship of power supply to power demand but uh, a spaghetti image of what we could imagine that uh, cells are able to endure, in some cases surviving quite nicely, maybe thriving, but in many other cases uh, barely maintaining themselves. Okay, if we return to this idea of seismicity, uh, this is a plot that's familiar showing plate boundaries and what, what we often think about when we see this, we think about the location of earthquakes, uh, volcanic uh, systems around the planet, and the, the nature of these different uh, boundaries. If, if we consider these actually as places where life can exist and life can live, not just at the location, say, where uh, thermal vents come out, but in the subsurface, in locations where earthquakes occur, there will be fluid movement, there will be changes in chemistry. These have been studied uh, quite a bit, but what we don't know is how microorganisms respond to this. So if you, if you look at the, the uh, sort of the high caliber earthquakes that are noted in the news often, these may not happen so often on a human time scale, fortunately, but on a microbial time scale, they happen quite frequently if you think of these cells in the earth living for long periods. So anytime something like this happens and you have movement of fluids, shock waves moving through the subsurface, changing of chemistry, you could imagine that microorganisms would, uh, would change their processes, maybe even grow instantaneously. And at the other end of the spectrum, things that may not even be generally uh, felt by uh, many humans, though they can be sensed, are millions of earthquakes suggesting that the planet is, is moving quite a bit. And this, this really doesn't even look at other variables that might also be subtleties in how we understand life in the subsurface. The type of plate boundary, whether these are deep or shallow faults, and whether they are the, the nature of the event. Uh, just the other day, talking to somebody, you know, I thought earthquakes would stimulate life, but then people were talking about how compaction can occur, and I thought, whoa, in the subsurface, that would be really bad for life to be compacted, so maybe earthquakes aren't always good. So, I, I, for life, I would, uh, I would summarize by saying that we need to change our frame of reference if we're going to study these organisms in Earth's subsurface or in the subsurface of places elsewhere. And in fact, other places might be more favor, the, the subsurface of other planets or moons might be more favorable for life. Uh, I think this calls for a sort of an anti-reductionist, holistic approach to uh, the science and paying attention to multiple sciences. Can help us uh, design our observation of deep life, certainly uh, bearing in mind what the real constraints of this life may be and where to look and uh, how to generate hypotheses for where to look. Thank you. Okay, and finally, it is my pleasure to introduce Mary Wojtek, who's going to tell us how to find E.T. There you go. Well, 
Thank you all for hanging around and thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this. This has been great. And thank to all the speakers before me that actually set the stage and actually showed several of my slides. So this is great. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity for those of you that have no idea what astrobiology is to let you know that this is not astrobiology. Um, some people think it's a uh, discipline without a subject um, because it, it suggests from from its name that it's about studying life beyond Earth, as if there was life beyond Earth. And while I'm sure there is, we haven't found it, and we certainly aren't studying it just yet. But we're using a variety of disciplines to ask some very fundamental questions about the origin and evolution of life here on Earth. And as we understand the limits to life here on Earth, and we start understanding more about the environments that are out in space, we can actually answer, uh, are we alone? Is anyone else out there? <clears throat> so you've already heard a couple of ways that research that's being done in, in biogeosciences um, is really important to astrobiology. And one of them that uh, really was critical to us being part of the establishment of biogeosciences was understanding life in extreme environments. So we know that our Earth is habitable, it's inhabited, and there, we might even think there's intelligent life here. Um, but to understand if that could be anywhere else, we need to know about other environments. And most other places in our own solar system, at least, are much more extreme, at least in terms of my comfortable home and the, the temperature, the, the air quality. Um, it, it, it's a difficult place for at least us to live, but microbes have shown us time and time again that they can live just about anywhere. So what do we know about Earth microbes? They're metabolically diverse. They can basically eat anything and breathe anything. Um, I know that there are things that they can't, but it's pretty remarkable when you hear that shortly after we started uh, throwing out our computers, they discovered a microorganism that could actually start using, uh, degrade the silicon chips from, from computers and get energy from it. So they're pretty remarkable. They're tough, they can live and thrive in extreme environments, and it's tenacious. They can also survive under really harsh um, conditions. And, and the final thing that isn't up here is that when life gets really tough, it goes underground or into rocks. So uh, it knows uh, various ways, or it has figured out how to um, survive um, by protecting itself as well. This is just a series of pictures of some of the extreme environments where we find microorganisms. We know that they can live at pHs of zero less than battery acid, it can pH of 13, like lye. Um, they're hot, they're thermophilic, they're psychrophilic. Um, they can live in all sorts of tremendous, I mean, they're, they're the Guinness Book of World Records in terms of life on, on our planet. And so this is very encouraging as we look for other places in our solar system that we might find um, life. So there's this concept of habitable zones. Um, we're definitely in the habitable zone. There's Venus, who's a little too close to our sun and a little too hot. There's Mars that's a little further out and maybe too cold, but maybe it always wasn't uh, as cold and inhospitable as it was um, as it is today. There are also the moons that you've seen of Saturn, Jupiter, and Neptune that uh, Julie showed you. And I want to start out with our, our nearest neighbor, and as I'm sure you've all, NASA is always announcing we have found water on Mars. Uh, and that's because we believe at one point in time, close to for maybe for its first billion and a half years, that it had more water on Mars than on, on our own planet. And in fact, um, we believe, um, well, this is a, a theory, it's still uh, up for debate. But there are certainly features all over Mars. I'm sure you've seen the deltas, the rivers, um, we see evidence of, um, you know, water uh, almost everywhere uh, as you look on the, on the current surface. And we think that it lost, uh, basically, uh, only remains 13% of the original water that it ha has. So losing 87% through various processes uh, resulting in um, atmospheric escape. I'm going to talk, we've seen this image before. These are the moons of Saturn, Jupiter, and Triton is a moon of Neptune. These are all moons that we believe host a subsurface ocean. 
And just to give you an idea, if you look on the left, that's the amount of water. If you pull together all the water on, on Earth, including probably not a great estimate, but some estimate of groundwater. And that's what we think is contained in those ice-covered moons. So if water is, well, first of all, I should say um, astrobiology is agnostic about elements. We love them all, or particularly if they're important for, well, actually, we love them all. Um, <laughs> But we, we definitely need water, and so that has been a focus of certainly of our search. And just to let you know, if you were going to look for life and you could choose left or right, I mean, in, in the grand scheme of the, our own planet, it's actually pretty dry. Just going to talk about, uh, mine again doesn't have data, it's just sort of talking about the exciting things. I think in, in the past, um, for, bio, for astrobiology, it's been really important to understand that biology is a planetary process, and I think that's what biogeosciences does for us. Um, it actually um, has incorporated not, you know, a lot of people were talking about what geology or geosciences has to do for biology, but biology in, impacts all of those as well. So it's, it's finally um, come to its, its own right. Uh, but some of the exciting things that have happened in, the, in very recent years is discovering, again, evidence of this water on those icy moons. This is a picture of jets coming out of Enceladus. This is believed to be water um, or uh, um, coming from the subsurface ocean. And we've made measurements that actually indicate that there's lots of hydrogen present, there's CO2 present. Um, most of the ingredients that we would need to support life, we can measure in these, in these plumes. Um, and that suggests that this is all coming from hydrothermal activity. So the results that you saw Julie give you actually speak to at least the system geophysically could support um, something like uh, hydrothermal life. And, and we have evidence that that water-rock interaction is actually happening. And so I believe if you took water from this moon and tried to grow methanogens in it, you would actually um, get them to grow. Now, we don't know yet if, if they're there, but we're interested in going to, to see them. We've also seen them on Europa, um, so which is where NASA is planning to go next. Um, and I just want to end my talk with a couple of ideas that now when you look out and, you know, so I've talked about habitable places within our own solar system. If we look up at the sky at night, we don't see billions of stars. Carl Sagan would see billions and billions of exoplanets. And amongst those, how many do you expect are going to be uh, Earth-like? Well, our surveys so far aren't targeting looking at Earth-like planets. They're looking at things that um, are, are sized and positioned in their solar systems very differently. Um, but we expect there can be uh, terrestrial-sized planets at the right distance from their sun. In fact, we know of two systems that were just announced recently. So Proxima Centauri b has an exoplanet that could be potentially habitable. And then the TRAPPIST system actually has seven terrestrial-sized planets that if it, that are um, basically clumped in an orbit that's similar to where Mercury is in our own solar system, but in a dimmer star. So they may be habitable as well. So what's the importance of this and what's the future? I love, um, I actually I love most of Carl Sagan's quotes, but um, this is a great one. The nature of life on Earth and the quest for life elsewhere are two sides of the same question, the search for who we are. And that just means to me that in the future, as we continue to explore systems beyond our own planet, we will learn more about how Earth actually functions um, in all of its spheres. So thank you. Well, that was amazing. Um, so ends the pulse session of our centennial triad today. Um, at 10.20, not 10.30, 10.20 starts the transformation session, the transformation of our thinking in biogeosciences sciences over the last um, century. Um, let's go grab a coffee. But first, before we do that, let's thank our speakers once more for fabulous talks and staying on time. <laughs> <laughs>